improvements in jet engine technology have, to a large extent, been the driving force for the marketing increase of capability for every new generation of fighter aircraft. What is meant by capability, though, is hard to define exactly. Well, speed has not increased since the 60s or the 70s, and the demand for that, which for half a century was so dominating, seemed to have disappeared in the 90s. Versatility, instead, has taken the front row. Generation 4 and 4.5 fighters are usually designed to be well-balanced aircraft, either large or small, but capable of fulfilling a wide range of missions. There is no need to explain why the selection of the engine is one of the key points in designing a combat aircraft. Saab already had a rather problematic experience with the engine chosen for the Viggen, which had its share of problems, to be honest. Being a civilian engine turned into a military-grade engine, it had the tendency to incurring into severe surging at large angle of attack, angles not normally operated by airliners, and this could cause the complete loss of the aircraft. The problem was eventually fixed, but not without costly engine and intake modifications. Although powerful in afterburner mode and with low specific fuel consumption uh, because of high bypass ratio, it did not possess a key quality for a military engine. A military engine must be 100% reliable, particularly in the hands of a hard-fisted combat pilot fully occupied with his tasks. For Saab, the 100% military General Electric F404 engine represented the natural answer for a lightweight fighter propulsion unit. In fact, the Swedish company had its eyes on the American engine since its inception. It was small in size with a thrust to weight ratio of 8, and it was proven since it was already flying in the early F-18s. Actually, it was also the engine of the F-20 Tiger Shark, but that plane never took <laughs> off. <laughs> Anyhow, since the engine was not going to be in a twin configuration like on the F-18, some more trust was required. The version that Volvo manufactured under license with the designation RM12 had a maximum thrust increased to 80 kN, up from the 71 kN thrust in the US Navy version. The TF404 turned out to be very satisfactory. Other than having a good thrust to weight ratio and an acceptable specific fuel consumption, it proved itself to be remarkably insensitive to the angle of attack or side slip. The inlet guide vanes modified by Volvo turn out to be very effective and engine surges are extremely rare and easily recoverable. In the Gruppen, the engine is placed at the fuselage rear end, well behind the usual location. Something that was not possible on previous Saab fighters like the Draken or the Viggen, since the resulting longitudinal instability otherwise would have been unacceptable for the pilot. Those aircraft had their internals arranged to have the engine close to the center of gravity, occupying valuable room in the mid-fuselage region. <laughs> 
The grip and unstable design allowed for the position of the center of gravity to be behind the aerodynamic center of the wing. Internal space was freed from the engine and it was used to house the main landing gear, for example, and some other fuel tanks and any kind of equipment. As we have seen in another video, this allowed to design a smooth tail cone that greatly reduces the drag of the fuselage and it is one of the Gripen's landmark features. All the Swedish fighters require short takeoff and landing performances. Since they are dispersed in makeshift airstrips often derived from roads, they need to take off and land in very confined spaces. This requirement is often satisfied by aerodynamic means, but the propulsion design may be involved too. In fact, the Viggen had pioneered the use of thrust reversal in a military fighter. But it turned out to be a not so ideal solution, to be honest. It added weight and increased the weight drag because it was making the fuselage rather stubby at the rear end. It was also complex and it turned out to be dangerous to tune because it caused at least one aircraft loss after touchdown because of an asymmetrical reverse thrust. For the Gripen, thrust reversal was actually considered but it turned out, luckily, not to be necessary, even if, even if the field performance requirements were only mildly relaxed if compared to its predecessor. This was accomplished through a higher thrust-to-weight ratio at takeoff and higher trim and lift coefficient at landing, despite the fact that the angle of attack at the approach is 1.5 degree less than the Vegan. The Gripen was also given an automatic landing mode, triggered by the nose wheel contact with the ground. When it is engaged, it commands a large deflection of the canard uh, of the elevons and the air brakes. Together with the brakes on the landing gear, it can stop the plane in a very short space. This is the last video about the grip and design. I hope I have given you some sketches of the elements considered during the design of a modern fighter. I am conscious it wasn't particularly entertaining, but it wasn't meant to be. I wanted to give a window on the actual work behind modern combat aviation. It is not as cool as aerobatics or shooting weapons, but it is the background that makes everything possible. If you like this video, I am sure you will be interested in the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything in the future. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar or Patreon, that would be amazing. In the meanwhile, thank you very much for watching, stay safe and see you next time.